When it comes to parenthood, one of these mile markers, as we've shared already today, is graduation. Maybe it's graduation from high school or graduation from college, but nevertheless, we, as parents, we go, now what? Now what do we do? Well, you know, there was a young man that was getting ready to graduate from college, and uh, his father was a man of, of great wealth, and uh, he told his father, he says, when, when I graduate from college, Dad, I have my eye on this uh, incredible sports car that um, I know you can afford, and that's what I'd like to have for my graduation. His dad didn't say much to him, but as it got closer to graduation day, he was hopeful. He was looking for signs that maybe his dad had, had purchased this car for him and, uh, because he thought, uh, well, it's not a big deal, right? Well, the day came for graduation that morning, and his dad called him into his private office. He says, son, I just want to tell you. He says, I am so proud of you. I am so glad to have you as my son, and I love you so very much. He says, I have a gift for you. And, of course, the son's getting all excited about this, hoping that it's, you know, the car in the garage or something with a bow on it. But his dad hands him this box that's beautifully wrapped. And the young man grabs the box, kind of disappointed. He's thinking, well, oh, maybe there's the keys in it. So he begins to unwrap it. And what he discovers in the box is this beautiful leather-bound Bible that has his name embossed in gold on it. And that young man in that moment put the Bible down on his dad's desk. And he says angrily, he says, Dad, really? With all the money you have, this is what I get for my graduation gift? No thanks. And he threw the Bible down on the desk and he took off. This young man left that relationship broken. And he left home to not return. I mean, he was successful by all means, had a beautiful home, beautiful family, but he'd left that relationship behind. But as he got older, as we all do, he kind of came to his senses, right? He said, I need to go back home and I need to restore that relationship that was broken. But before he had the opportunity to go and reconcile with his father, he got word that his father had passed. Now, the interesting thing about this was his father left everything to him. It was a great wealth, a great estate. And he was called to, to come and take care of the estate. So this young man comes back, devastated that he couldn't reconcile with his dad. And he found himself sitting in that same chair that his father was sitting at, the desk. You know what he saw at the corner of the desk? That very Bible that he left there so many years ago, never moved. He began to pick that Bible up, and he began to scroll through the pages. And, and one page was marked in particular by his father. It was Matthew 7:11. And it says, though we are evil people, know how we can give great gifts to our children. How much more shall your heavenly Father, which is in heaven, give to those who ask him? He sat, sat there for a moment, thinking about that. He continued to flip through the pages. And would you know it? Yes, a key fell out of the back of the Bible with a tag on it. And it was that sports car that he wanted. And on the tag it said, Paid in full. How much had he lost? And see, the problem is with this is many times we miss the gifts that God has for us. Why? Because they're not always packaged the way that we want them, right? Now, I'm going to tell you, graduates, your book of promises there, it doesn't have a key to a car or anything like that. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, I couldn't do that. I couldn't pull that off. But what I did give you is the gift to life, the truth to life, the promise for life. And I pray that you hold on to it and not be so quickly to just put it under your chair or in your closet, but you hold it close to you, always opening it up, looking for that truth. You know, church, it's easy to forget what life is about. When you have all these new opportunities coming at you, it's easy to forget about all the direction and all the caution that your parents and the people of influence have given you in this incredible movement towards this great accomplishment, this day of celebration that we have. 
It's easy to forget. You see, the greatest mistake that we make is that we embark on this new territory, believing that we've got it all figured out, right? I mean, we're graduates. I mean, we've got life figured out. And so many times we forget that we're not equipped for what is right before us, but we believe that we are. And in doing so, we often put distance between those who care the most for us. Because why? Because we don't want to hear their advice. We know what's best. We don't want to hear their truth. We just want to do what we believe is right for us. And we miss out. We miss out on what is really important. I mean, I get it. I've been there. And since then, I've learned how foolish that was to not listen and to not learn from those who have gone before me. There is wisdom in this. You see, the heart of God and the heart of a parent is not so different. The heart of a parent doesn't want to see you fail, nor does God. But failure often is a choice of foolishness. And as a parent, as a God, what we hope for is that you learn from it, that you'll step through it and become better because of it. But we cannot make those decisions for you. Change is unavoidable when it comes to these things. And so often, we find ourselves taking steps forward and often taking steps backwards, making choices every day that will impact the rest of our lives. But this is the question for parents and grandparents. What is the greatest gift that we can give to our children and grandchildren? What is it? It is truth. That is the greatest gift that we can give to them is truth. And the truth is this. We will not always be there for them. That is truth. But we need to be able to speak into their lives. Because we have a faith that we live out in Jesus' name. And if we can give that faith to our children and grandchildren, something that can become their own, something that can guide them through life's journey, now that's some, something worth giving. That's a gift that you do not want to discard, young people, is that gift of faith that comes to us. But see, with a gift, it's like anything else. We can give gifts, but if those who receive them never open the gift, then it is a gift that is filled with unfulfilled treasure and fulfillment. We cannot make them do that. So what do we do as parents and grandparents? Now what? Number one, when the parental voice becomes a distant whisper. Whew. Maybe you're already there, parents and grandparents. Maybe that parental voice has now become a distant whisper. You're thinking, my kids don't listen to me anymore. They think they have all this figured out. But you know, God understands your frustration. He understands your concern. Because when we look at his word in Isaiah, what we find here is God, once again, only wanting what is best for his children. Just like us as parents. He's wanting to see them through, walk them through, provide for them. He doesn't want them to fall and fail. But yet he gave us free will, didn't he? And just like a parent, God looked at the people of Israel when they became rebellious, when they didn't want to hear God's voice anymore, and it became a distant whisper. What does that look like? Well, in Isaiah chapter 1, through the prophet Isaiah, he speaks these words. Listen, O heaven. Pay attention, earth. This is what the Lord says the children I raised and cared for have rebelled against me. Even an ox knows its owner, and a donkey recognizes its master's care. But Israel doesn't know its master. My people don't recognize my care for them. I mean, this is a very defining moment for parents. When our children stop listening to our advice, when they stop listening to our wisdom, that's a defining moment for us. Because what have we done, parents? We've hoped for them. We have dreamed for them. We have cried for them. But yet when they're not willing to listen, it breaks our heart because we want only what is best for them. Is that so different from God? That's exactly how God wants to 
handle us. You know, at times it's hard. <laughs> it's hard to let go and let our children make the choices that they decide, knowing full well that those decisions may bring pain, may bring suffering. But in those moments, we have to understand that those are their choices. And they have to live in the consequences of their choices. Because until they understand where the victory in life comes from, the foundation for life is in question for them. And though we have the answer, parents, until it becomes their answer, it will not change their lives. So what are we giving to them? What is that answer? You know, I'm reminded in Psalms of how we often, as young hearts, approach life believing that we, we've got it all figured out. Turn with me to Psalms 33. I'm going to pick it up in verse 16. Listen to this. It says, The best equipped army cannot save a king, nor is great strength enough to save a warrior. Don't count on your war horse to give you victory for all its strength. It cannot save you. But the Lord watches over those who fear him, those who rely on his unfailing love. He rescues them from death and keeps them alive in times of famine. He puts our hope, our hope in the Lord. He is our help and our shield. These are the words that we need to give to our children. Because so many times they think they've got it figured out. So many times we think we've got it figured out. Victory belongs to me. But it doesn't. It belongs to the Lord. We have to begin to rely on him in every way possible. We have to trust in his voice as we journey through this life. But this is the thing that I love about his word is his promises. Because I know that my children may reach a time where they don't listen to dad. We've already been there. <laughs> oh, we've been there. And I keep sharing with them, hoping that they hear. But this is what I want you to hear from Revelation 3.20. This is a great scripture to hold on to. Jesus says these words, Look, I stand at the door and knock. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in. And we will share a meal together as friends. What I love about this is even though they may stop listening to my voice, and though I may not be in their life because they move or do whatever, God will never stop pursuing them through his son Christ. He will continually knock on the hearts of each of our young people, saying, let me in. Let me guide you. Let me show you. And the beauty is when they do invite him in, it's an incredible journey of faith for them. So even though we may not always be able to be with our graduates, Christ is always pursuing them, always knocking on their door. But I want you to know this, parents, that even though your voice may become a distant whisper, Jesus will never stop speaking to the hearts of your children and grandchildren. So they're on the way. Now what? What do we do? Some of you may be empty nesters for the first time. What do we do? Do we stay up late at night praying for our kids, wondering how they're getting by? Yeah, we do. But what else do we do? You know, I look at Ephesians. And when I look at Paul, there's a lot of parental aspects of how he handles the church in the same regards of how we should handle our children. God gave Paul a special responsibility. Do you feel that, parents? That God gave you a special responsibility when it comes to kids? Absolutely. But Paul approached this, and this special responsibility was he was to go to the Gentiles. Nobody wanted to go to the Gentiles. Nobody wanted to give the good news to the Gentiles. Jews, yes. But Gentiles, not so much. But God says you need to go. You need to give the Gentiles the same good news that the Jews have received. This plan is for them as it is for everyone. Go and tell them. So Paul did. He reached to them. He talked to them about the endless treasures that they could have as children of God. And it sparked an interest within each of them. Now listen to this. We'll read to you Ephesians 3. We'll pick it up in verse 14. 
Now realize, this is Paul's heart. This is his desire and his responsibility. I want you to see the passion in what he does with this. When I think of all of this, I fall to my knees and pray to the Father, the creator of everything in heaven and on earth. I pray from his glorious, unlimited resources that he will empower you with inner strength through his spirit. Then Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust in him. Your roots will grow down into God's love and keep you strong. And may you have the power to understand, as God people should, how wide, how long, how high, and how deep his love is. May you experience the love of Christ, though it is too great to understand fully. Then you will be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. Is that not the same thing that we should be doing as parents? That when our kids are going off, when they're leaving, that we're going to our knees and we are saying, Lord, I want them to understand. I want them to know the foundation they can have in you. Are we praying this truth into their lives? Are we just worried about them taking care of their bills and getting the job that they want? Not that those things are not important, but this is life and they need to understand it. Never underestimate. Never underestimate your voice as a parent or as a grandparent. The way your voice is heard, it may need to change, I'm telling you. Your kids may put some distance between you, thinking, I've got this, but never speak, stop speaking to them. You may have to write them a letter. Maybe they won't take your calls. Write them a letter, text them, email, do whatever is necessary to keep speaking in their lives. Well, they won't respond. They won't reply. I don't care. Keep speaking truth into them. Keep giving them reason to go back to the truth of God's word. Give them that reason, and they will find it. Let God soften their hearts, because often we cannot. And when God softens their heart, he gives them a greater understanding of what this life is all about. But parents, we need to put into practice our loudest and most impactful voice that we have. You know what it is? Prayer. That is our loudest voice that we have is prayer. I know this because I know my life was altered because of my mother's prayers. I know that I was released from some pain of life because of my mother's prayers. I know this. So we need to have that loud voice of prayer for each of them. Prayer, number two. Prayer is not the last resort, but it's the first response. Too many times we say, oh, I, I, what, I don't know what to do. I guess I'll pray. No. Our first response is, Lord, before they embark on this journey of whatever, we start praying for them. We hit our knees daily and we pray for them. How we pray and what we pray for is absolutely important. And oftentimes this means parents that we have to put aside our own personal desires to see the greater picture that God has for them. Have we ever asked God, what is your purpose for them? Parents, we have all kinds of purposes. We know what we want for our kids. But what does God want? And are we willing to ask that question? You know, Paul, as I said, had often had this parental spirit about him. And as he goes to the people in, in Colossae, the church there, he has the same opportunity to speak into their lives. You know, Paul prayed. Before he even went there, he prayed that they would receive this good news. He prayed in advance for what this would become. And then when that seed of faith began to grow within these folks, he celebrated. And that's exactly what we need to do with our own children. We need to pray in advance for their lives and their life of faith. I want you to listen to this. In Colossians 1 and verse 9, listen to what Paul says. So we have not stopped praying for you since we first heard about you. We ask God to give you complete knowledge of his will and to give you spiritual wisdom and understanding. Then the way you will live will always honor and please the Lord. And your lives will produce every kind of good fruit. All the while, you will grow as you learn to know God better 
and better. That prayer was not just for them. That prayer should be in the heart of every parent, every grandparent, as we pray up our children, as we send them off. This should be our prayer, that they would have a deeper understanding, a knowledge of who God is, to make him the foundation and the center of their lives. Is that what we're doing? Do we understand this truth? Do our children understand what this looks like? You know, we need to be more excited. We need to be an excitable kind of people when it comes to this. We need to be excited when we see our children and our grandchildren stepping into a faith that is worth having. We get more excited about the temporary. We should be more concerned about their faith journey than we are about what kind of degree they're earning. For this is only temporary. And it's empty without Christ at the center of it. You see, we get really excited about the accolades, don't we? But we need to get more excited about their faith because that's what really matters. And that's what will carry us on. But you know, prayer is one of the things that opens doors. I've seen it. It softens even the hardest of hearts. And when that door is opened into our children's lives, we need to speak wisdom and truth into it. Now listen to this. I love this. Proverbs has a lot of, a lot of wisdom that can be had. Turn with me to Proverbs 2. Now, you can see that I'm reading a lot of Scripture today, and there's a reason for it. Because they don't need to hear my word. They need to hear God's word. And we need to have the word of God open as often as we can. Chapter 2 says this. My child, listen to what I say and treasure my commands. Tune your ears to wisdom and concentrate on understanding. Cry out for insight and ask for understanding. Search for them as you would silver. Seek them like hidden treasures. Then you will understand what it means to fear the Lord, and you will gain knowledge of God. For the Lord grants wisdom. From his mouth comes knowledge and understanding. He grants a treasure of common sense to the honest. He is a shield to those who walk with integrity. He guards the path of the just and protects those who are faithful to him. Are those words that need to be spoken into our children's lives? Yes, they need common sense. They need to be men and women of integrity. They need to be men and women of faith. And if they're not hearing it from us, what are they hearing? What are they hearing in all of this? You know, Paul continued to speak into the church. We go back to Ephesians again. In Ephesians 4, Paul was saying, children of God, he says, I beg you, I beg of you to understand this truth of Christ. Are we saying that to our children? Are we begging with them? Now, you may say, I'm not going to beg. When you understand what is at stake, you will. It is their life at stake. And Paul understood what was at stake here for them. He says, I beg of you to live a life that is worthy. Stop living a reckless life. Understand what God has for you. He says, make every effort to be unified with the Spirit of God. And then he starts talking to the church leaders. And he says, you guys are equipped in a special way to equip God's children. Is that not the same for us as parents? We have been equipped to train up our children, to raise them in our faith, so it can become their faith. Listen to this, Ephesians. Ephesians 4.14. I know what Paul wanted for those people. Do your children know what you want for them when it comes to faith? Paul says these words. Then we will no longer be immature like children. We won't be tossed and blown about by every wind of new teaching. We will not be influenced when people try to trick us. With lies so clever, they sound like truth. Is that not our culture today or what? And we need to speak against this. We need to understand that we have to speak this truth into their lives. Do they know what you desire for them in Christ? You know, even with all the prayer and the wisdom that we pour over our children, they still need to decide. They need, need to decide how they're going to live their life. Not just about how, what they're going to do for a living, but how they're going to live their life for Christ. 
Now, though we may try, we can't choose for them, can we? We try. We try to push them. We can't make those decisions. We can't live for them. We can't take all their battles on, even though we try. We can't. But Christ can. So we need to stop trusting in our own ability and start trusting in God with his perfect plan of provision for each of our children. You know, I don't even know how many years it's been since I've graduated. It's been, been a while. I kind of forget. But whether you're graduating today or soon to graduate as some of you young people or it's way behind us, this statement that I'm going to share with you, it never changes. It doesn't matter what season of life you're in. And this is the statement I'm going to give you. You must choose who is Lord of your life. That's the third point. You must choose who is Lord of your life. Now, this is the thing that I want to explain again. When it comes to Jesus, we love Jesus as Savior. We want somebody to save us from hell. But the Word tells us you need to accept him as Lord and Savior, doesn't it? And so many times we stop short of that. Savior, I'm good with. I don't want hell. Jesus, save me. But Lord means what for us? The Lordship of Christ means that we surrender every aspect of our life to him. Every aspect. Lordship means that we give him the authority. We give him the freedom to speak into our lives, to rule and reign in our lives. And that's what I want for my children. And I hope that's what you want for your children. But you know what? It has to begin at home with you. Jesus cannot just be Savior. He has to be Lord. And we have to surrender our will to him. I see this in Luke. Turn with me to Luke chapter 6. We pick it up in verse 46. He says, so why do you keep calling me Lord, Lord, when you don't do what I say? I will show you what it's like when someone comes to me, listens to my teaching, and then follows it. It is like a person building a house who digs deep and lays the foundation on solid rock. When the flood waters rise and break against the house, it stands firm because it was built well. But anyone who hears and doesn't obey is like a person who builds a house without a foundation. When the floods sweep down against the house, it will collapse into a heap of ruins. This is so true that we must help our children understand the foundation for which they need to build their life upon. Why do we do what we do? Why do we live the way we live? Why do we make the choices we make? Do our children understand this? Do they understand the foundation for which we have built our lives? Now, in 1 Peter, Peter understands what we are up against, what our young people are up against. He says, I understand there's going to be challenges. I understand the world is going to resist this good news. I know the world's going to push in on your children. But what did he say? He says, don't worry. Don't worry about that. He says in this verse, verse 15, he says, instead, you must worship Christ as Lord of your life. And if someone asks you about your Christian hope, always be ready to explain it. Do our children understand the foundation for which they live? Do they, are they able to answer for the hope that they have in Christ? Can we as parents answer this? Because listen to me, the world will challenge this every day of their lives. And if our children do not know who they are in Christ, the world will gladly come in and tell them who they should be. Do you agree with me? This is why we have to get the word of God open and get it into their hearts. So what will be our constant voice in our lives? Graduates, what will be your constant voice in your life? Ephesians, again, it gives us some incredible insight. Ephesians 5, it says, Imitate God, therefore, in everything you do, because you are his dear children. Live a life filled with love, flowing, following the example of Christ. He loved us and offered him, himself as a sacrifice for us, a pleasing aroma to God. This is what we're supposed to look like. But too many times we don't offer ourselves up this way. And he goes on to say, he says, 
let me tell you, children of God, what I warn you against. He says, I warn you against a life of living in sexual immorality, impurity, greed, foolish talk, coarse joking. Now, I add this, but we often find this on the campuses across America. We find this far from home are these bases for which our kids often live in because they don't have truth. And if they do have truth, they're not living in that truth. So what are we to do with this? So many of us follow this path of least resistance. And it makes it so difficult for us to discover the call that God has on our lives, especially for our children. But then he goes on in verse 6. He says, don't be fooled by those who try to excuse their sins. For the anger of God will fall on all of those who disobey him. Don't participate in these things people do. For once you were full of darkness, but now you have light from the Lord. So live as people of light. For this light within you produces only what is good and right and true. This is where he wants us to live. He wants our children to be a light into this dark world. So what does it look like to live a life truly surrendered to the Lordship of Jesus Christ? What should be coming forth from the words of our mouths, from our hearts? What should we hope for our graduates to be speaking when it comes to this? We'll close with this because it's very practical for us. Will you turn with me to Psalms 119? In Psalms 119, it gives us a very practical view of what a life surrendered to the Lordship of Christ should look like. We should be saying this. Give me understanding, and I will obey your instructions. I will put them into practice with all of my heart. Make me walk along the path of your commands, for that is where my happiness is found. Give me an eagerness for your laws rather than a love for money. Turn my eyes from worth, worthless things and give me life through your word. Reassure me of your promise made to those who fear you. Help me abandon my shameful ways, for your regulations are good. I long to obey your commandments. Renew my life with your goodness. Lord, give me your unfailing love, the salvation that you have promised me. That's what a surrendered life under the Lordship of Christ should look like. This is what we should be praying that comes forth from the lives of our children. Because see, the practical view is this. We all have to acknowledge our need for a Savior and for a Lord in our lives. We have to surrender to his authority, right? Just because you know of Christ doesn't mean that you'll follow Christ. To surrender says, Lord, not my will, but your will be done. That is a surrendered life. But you also have to confess your desires. That we often have a love for money, a love for power, a love for position. Do we have that same kind of love for the Lord? Are we willing to put that same kind of passion there? We have to be willing to be real about our doubts and fears. And be willing to say, as it was said in the word, reassure me of your promises. There's days, Lord, I don't understand this life. But reassure me. That's what we should be wanting to hear. We need a healthy perspective a healthy self-awareness of what our journey looks like. Because sometimes we have to say, Lord, help me abandon my wrong ways. We've lived in them so long, often, that we have become very comfortable with them, have we not? And sometimes we have to ask the Lord, help me abandon this, because I know it is not good. And we need to share this with our children. And finally, Lord Jesus, without you, I'm nothing. Without you, I have no purpose. But with you, I am a new creation. With you, I have a great future. With you, I am promised future glory. That's what we need to be hearing from the hearts of our children. That's what we need to be instilling in each of our lives. May God be praised through the lives of our children. And may our children praise God for their lives through us. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this moment to reflect, this moment to celebrate. But Lord, this moment to understand that when we surrender them to you, it is far better than anything that we could ever give to them. 
Lord, I pray that our graduates and for each of us, that we would never allow your voice to become a distant whisper. That we would always be ready to receive, quick to our knees to pray, quick to our knees to listen. So, Father, we give you this day. We lay our lives before you. And we say, Lord, please, mold us into what you want us to be. And help us discover the beauty of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus. Amen. I come up here for communion. But I'm going to share a few words that I wish was said to me when I was younger. <clears throat> you choose who is Lord of your life. That's the third point. You choose who is the Lord of your life. <clears throat> there was a young king named Hezekiah. It says in scripture, his mother, <clears throat> or he was 25 years old when he became king. And he reigned in Jerusalem 29 years. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, just as his father David had done. He removed the high places, smashed the sacred stones, and cut down the asher poles. He broke into pieces the bronze snake Moses had made. For up to that point time, the Israelites had been burning incense to it point of this scripture is he removed the things that weren't about God that were distractions from the real purpose and the real relationship Hezekiah trusted in the Lord the God of Israel there was no one like him among all the kings of Judah either before him or after him he had he held fast to the Lord and did not stop following him he kept the commands the Lord had given Moses. He lived a holy life. He trusted and sought out a relationship. And it says, and the Lord was with him. He was successful in whatever he undertook. For our graduates, seek God. The rest falls in place. For the rest of us, seek God. And the rest falls in place. In your time, I'm going to ask you here soon, come up, bring your first fruits, bring your hearts, or bring your lives. Come, take the bread, his body broken, to show you how deep his love is. Take the juice, his blood, sacrificed to remind you of his promise, the same promise that Hezekiah lived in, the same promise that Moses lived in, the same promise that that Jesus fulfilled and the forgiveness of our sins. Come forward in your moment, remember him, and live that life, seek that relationship.